into our regularly scheduled workshop meeting for August 20th, uh, 2020. Uh, as you can see, we are all five present today, so it's great to see everybody back today, and Mr. Chambers and Mr. McGinnis are here as well. And uh, we do have staff and visitors in the audience today. So we'll move on down to approval of the agenda, 2.1 changes to agenda and approval of agenda, and we do have one change consent agenda added item 8.20 request closure of the Riverside Elementary School child care program so at this time we have no recognitions uh, no visitors uh, no administrative personnel uh, public comment we do actually have a blue card this morning and this would be members of the public desiring to address the school board for MIS 5241 public input and or discussion of agenda items uh, Mr. McInnes, before we have our uh, speaker come up, would you please explain the rules to yes, public comment? Uh, you'll have four minutes to make your presentation to the board, and I'll give you a 15 second warning from time to time. Okay. And uh, we do have Josh Morris. If Mr. Morris, if you would please come to the podium, state your name and your address for the record, please. My name is Josh Morris, 814 Flower and Path here in Niceville. Um, I'd emailed you all this information I'm going to cover I just wanted to present it uh, for the broader public for those that responded I, I appreciate your time and, and thank you for that mr. chambers um, there's a letter signed by you from the district uh, strongly recommending the use of masks everywhere where social distancing cannot be maintained uh, with the caveat that there'd be continued discussion with employees and parents which is why I'm here <clears throat> I've got scientific data presented by doctors in the field over the efficacy and the effectiveness of mass in schools or children and I'd like to go over that data uh, Clumpus at all one might argue that fear and anxiety are better countered with data and education than with a marginally beneficial mask they were published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine in May and clearly identify that mask wearing provides little protection from infection outside of a healthcare facility or other closed environments unless it's added to already standard practice of hand washing, eye protection, gloves, and a gown. Their initial work was obviously <clears throat> to push for universal mask wearing. Uh, they highlight that significant exposure for a person means face-to-face -face contact within six feet with a person with symptomatic COVID-19 and not asymptomatic. And that that's sustained for at least a few minutes, some arguing more than 10 minutes and up to a half hour. <clears throat> their conclusion was that expanded masking protocols greatest contributions may be to reduce the transmission of anxiety over and above whatever role that the mask may play in reducing transmission of COVID-19. Brousseau and Sitsema in the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy of this year encouraged the masses to not expect a cloth face mask to protect them or those around them. They posited that mask mandates were not based on sound data that their article for the Center of Infectious Disease Research and Policy highlights that the CDC excluded the National Academy of Sciences rapid expert consultation on the effectiveness of fabric masks for COVID-19 pandemic that fabric masks may reduce the transmission of the largest respiratory droplets. Little evidence regarding the transmission of small aerosolized particles uh, of the size potentially exhaled by asymptomatic or presymptomatic individuals, individuals with COVID-19. McIntyre and Hassanane go on to state that seasonal coronaviruses are more prevalent in aerosols than in larger droplet forms. Airborne vector of the virus would necessitate the use of N95 masks as we've been preached to uh, rather than standard surgical masks or even cloth masks. The filtration of cloth masks is much less effective than that of surgical masks. The World Health Organization prior to all of this even recommended against mask wearing instead opting for hand hygiene and social distancing. McIntyre et al. stated that a randomized trial of cloth mask efficacy was conducted in 2015 and found substantially higher lab confirmed infection rates among healthcare workers that donned cloth masks versus those that wore surgical masks. They also concluded the dangers to wearing masks can increase infection rates even when double masking due to the moisture retention, liquid diffusion, and pathogen retention of cloth masks. So my question after this, so who's prepared to outfit their small child with an N95 mask 
that to be worn properly has to be mask fitted for them to specifically be able to wear it only for them and deal with the headaches and other seconds. side effects that many healthcare workers complain of the mask causing. The two questions that I have for this board and for you, Mr. Superintendent. <clears throat> The data doesn't support COVID-19 as a more dangerous threat to our children than influenza historically has. And given the time, I wasn't able to get to that. The research does not support a mask wearing mandate to combat COVID-19 as a viable option for school children. And as a concerned parent of an elementary age child, there's no relevant data to support governance mandating or even strongly recommending masks for children in a learning environment. So what punitive measures are gonna be taken against the children that do not wear a mask in these schools? And second, what assurances do you provide that the more overbearing educators employed in the schools will not somehow intimidate children into strongly recommending that they wear a mask? All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we will move down to section seven, committee and staff reports uh, 7.1 is in-county travel paid for the period of July 23rd through August 5th, 2020. And then 7.2 is out-of-county travel paid for the period of July 23rd through August 5th, 2020. And then we're at section 7.3, update on reopening schools during COVID-19. And Mr. Chambers, I will pass this off to you. Thank you, sir. I think as, uh, as the board knows, I wanna have a, a discussion about uh, masks today and I think you also know our you know our current stance right now in our reopening schools plan is to strongly encourage masks anywhere where social distancing can't be maintained and I think you know early on we did a we did a survey with uh, employees where about 56 percent of them did not want to mandate masks and more recently you know I've asked uh, principals to uh, to talk with their employees, talk with their teachers, and I will say, uh, and that that data is still coming in, but there's there's more employees right now that uh, would like some form of a requirement of mass in some way, shape, or form. Okay, and, and I'll have more of that information for you as as information comes in. I also want to say, I think uh, you know, Dr. Chapman came before the board and. Um, so she presented some, um, some of her thoughts of what she believes on, on masks. And once again, you know, our, our current stance is strongly recommend where social distancing can't be maintained. I think over the last number of um, board meetings, we, we've discussed uh, the topics of masks and we've, uh, and, and not necessarily in great depth, but, it, but it's been brought up. And, um, and I know Dr. Kelly, I know you've kind of made your stance, uh, I think, very clear in terms of uh, you believe that there should be a requirement of, uh, of masks, and, and I respect that. Um, but what I would like to do with is- With conditions, though, remember. With, with, with conditions, yes, ma'am. Uh, but what I would like to do is kind of maybe open it up, maybe start with you, Dr. Kelly, and, and go, go through the board and, and have a discussion on where we feel um, you would like to lead us, and, and myself as well. Uh, with, with masks and whether we need to generate a, a policy or whether we stay with strongly encouraging where social distancing can't be maintained. So I'd kind of open that up. Sure. I don't mind starting that discussion. I, as I said before, I hold in high regard Dr. Chapman and any professional from the CDC or the World Health Organization or any other health care official that we lean into in any time we have a pandemic of this proportion. Uh, so with that being said, I have said many times over that I would like to, first of all, put in perspective that as a school district and having spent almost 40 years in the realm of education here and in other districts, I, I know that we require many other things as far as school supplies, calculators, rulers, pens, pencils, markers. Some classrooms require specific types of pen, pencils, markers. So I was just thinking that perhaps we could have a mask after we provide them, of course, starting out, to be on the person, on the student at all times, whether it's in their pencil bag, their binder, their backpack, however they want to keep them, it's on their person with their other school supplies. And then, as I said before, I'd like our teachers 
to have some prerogative over whether or not they feel the mask is required or mandated in their classroom. We have some classrooms and some teachers for whom it would be appropriate, I think, most of the time. For instance, I think of myself when I taught language arts. If I am doing lecture discussion from my podium or from the front of the room and my student desks don't start until seven or eight feet out, I might not think it's appropriate for them to have a mask on. But if I am having them in a small group and I'm going to be leaning over them, I might want them to be masked and I might want to have my own mask on as well to protect my students and to protect myself. I also think that they should be worn in situations where we can't social distance, certainly on the bus, certainly in the hall, until we get the pandemic under control, until Dr. Chapman and others tell us that we've flattened the curve enough or the percentages have gone down enough that we can do, we can eliminate these. I don't think that any of us wants to put a mask mandate in place forever and eternity, just until our professionals in the field tell us that we've done our due diligence and we've gotten this thing under control. The other thing I think of, to your point about discipline, I certainly appreciate Josh coming forward with that. That's definitely a point of my concern too. Having been a trainer of principals for many years now, I feel like that all of our good principals know how to create a climate and a culture in their building where it's not a punitive measure it is more of a climate and an understanding that we build in our clientele, our students, our parents, our visitors to campus, that this is how we take care of each other. And I wear a mask to protect you. You wear one to protect me. In our society, and our culture, in our school, we take care of each other. Just like if I see you drop your backpack, I'm going to pick it up and hand it to you. If my teacher drops her grade book, I'm going to pick it up for her. If someone has their arms full and they don't open the door, I'm gonna open the door for them. It's the way that the climate is instilled from the top down. And I think simply that we don't have to say, and, and we train our faculty, not that I think we have droves of faculty that would be punitive with that, but we tell them this is how we will deal with it. You forgot your mask or you don't have one, let me offer you one today. Not, you're going to the office, don't come back to my classroom until you have your mask. I don't perceive that to be any kind of climate in any of our schools. Um, I just think that we put it out there. You've used the terms care and compassion for over a year. I think that we put it out there, this is how we care for each other. We are compassionate people and this is what we do until our professional medical leaders tell us that we no longer need to do this. So, I hope okay. I've shared enough. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Vancheck? Well, it's a difficult situation, but uh, while I really respect what Dr. Kelly is saying, having spent my education career in a secondary situation on high school, my first thought, and I'm just kind of thinking this through, is that I, I know this for sure. I don't want the teacher to have to be, quote, the bad guy. I've worked in a situation where um, I've seen where maybe another teacher didn't follow a policy. I tried to enforce that policy in my classroom. I had, had to end up being the bad guy. Um, so if we allow teachers to make the decision in their classroom. While I think that sounds good, and I certainly respect them as professionals, I think there would be particularly, and like I said, my main experiences on the high school level, I think it would be su sending such a mixed message. So third period, you don't have to have a mask, but when you show up in Missy Banchek's class, you better have that mask. I think that sets up a, a problem. Um, I do agree that we're not going to have to hopefully do this forever, so maybe we could start with a policy knowing that hopefully by doing that we can drop that policy or, or ruling as we go along. Um, 
Again, I certainly do respect our medical professionals, and Dr. Chapman says she is an advocate of mass. Um, and I, I trust what she says. This is her expertise, um, and I trust her on that. So I think it's not whether I think the, the mask would be an important thing. It would be how do we implement that ruling? Do we go with the great suggestion of Dr. Kelly and allow some leeway, or do we just, you know, step up and just say so we're going to all the time. We're going to have um, have the mask, and that's it, it's a it's a tough. I understand what um, Mr. Morris is saying. He has a small child. Um, I've not worked that much in that area, but I can imagine to have a child that small to keep a mask on, or the kindergarten teacher that's trying to keep mask on, just really sends me, you know, kind of uh, with the chills. So that I'm, I'm eager to hear what my fellow board members have to say about that. I, 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 and Mr. Morris, I appreciate you sent us some wonderful information. However, the problem it is on even professional information of this type is somebody else can send us the direct opposite. That is the, the challenge right now. Our, our own, like I said, Dr. Chapman, our own health person, is saying that yes, we, you know, we the masks do, are effective, even even the, the, you know, the they don't have to be official or anything that they they do um, help. So, I, I'm convinced a mask does help, uh, from what I've seen. It's just that I think we're going to have to talk through how we're going to uh, implement that. Thank you. And, and just for just for clarification, so. Um, because when this all done, just just making sure that I, that I can understand, uh, you know, kind of where I need to go from here. But would you like to see some form of a requirement of some sort, or or not? You're asking me. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, like I said, if we if we go with the requirement, okay. Anytime you mandate something, then someone has to quote police it. All right. That puts a lot on our educators. I know. So. That's the thing. Are we right now? The way you've said is that we strongly recommend. So, you know, I can see that teacher saying, "Please get your mask on." And like Dr. Kelly said, doing it in, an, you know, not a get that mask on, but come on now, let's get the mat that kind of thing. So that's why I'm um, hesitant to make it a mandate because I hate to put that on those educators. One more thing to have to to uh, enforce. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Right. Mr. Destin. Oh, I get to be next, huh? <laughs> um, well, you can be the chairman and be last. That's, well, there you go. that's <laughs> sometimes a good position to work first. <laughs> yep. um, the medical professionals we have advising us from the CDC down, including Dr. Chapman, who I have a great deal of respect for, are quite clear what they think about masks. I think it's essential, and I think they're right. Uh, so then we get to the question of how do we do it? At this time, we are strongly recommending. Um, I'm not sure if we can say strongly, strongly. <laughs> I'm, and, I'm, and I am in a dilemma over how to mandate it without causing chaos in the schools, because what do we do with the kids who forgot it that day? Mm -hmm who say, I'm not wearing it, do we send them home? Um, but there has to be some mechanism, and I, and I hope that uh, superintendent and his staff have given some th thought how to put a little more teeth into it, and that's the direction we need to go. Um, with all due respect to the teachers, and I've been with them my entire life, uh, from my wife to my aunts to my mother-in-law to I've been surrounded. <laughs> uh, leaving the policy to them as individuals means we have no policy at all because there are a thousand, two thousand close to that. So we'd have two thousand policies. So that's not really an option in my mind. But we need to do everything we can to have masks on kids at every opportunity that they can do it because otherwise we are headed for a very short school system, a very short school year, 
uh, as we all know, we already have uh, a number of quarantines and positive tests in our system right now before we ever started. Uh, according to the figures I saw this morning, we're still hovering around an 8% infection rate percentage of those tested. We were at 12, 14, higher. But the CDC and Dr. Chapman say, unless we're below 5%, that's a real problem. And so we are not below 5%. Uh, the barriers we're trying to put up will help. They're the closest thing we can do to uh, cutting classes in half and go into split sessions, which we can't do. But the masks are vitally important. Without them, I don't see us being able to stay open very long. So I will rely on the superintendent and the geniuses that he has working for him to try to come up with some kind of policy that we think is reasonable to try to put a little oomph behind strongly recommended. Um, I know uh, in speaking to the superintendent, he would like to get a little more input from the public. That's never a bad idea, but we know what the science tells us. We know what the right thing is to do. We need to protect those kids as much as we possibly can. That's our job. And so, you know, that's where I stand on the issue. Okay. Dr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, whenever confronted with these kinds of very difficult and challenging decisions, um, I always like to try to look at the source documents and we all know that the executive order compelling us to open schools by August 31st, which of course we're going to, to do, um, also directs us to look at our local public health officials and their recommendations. And of course, in that case, that means that we look to what Dr. Chapman has to say. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, she has been unequivocal in her recommendation that we require masks in school. And so with that, uh, that's, that's what I look to. I look at the source document, what it says, and it refers to her specifically. I'd also uh, point out, uh, unless things have changed, I, I believe uh, our folks on the military installations are still requiring uh, face coverings. Um, and uh, I, I go a little, little further and say that when we talk about school governance, particularly in, in something like this, I think, I think there's probably some responsibility uh, and uh, accompanied by perhaps even some liability. Um, so with, with all that, uh, I would be interested in seeing some draft language, uh, some ideas that you might have worked up that uh, I could take a look at for specifics to see if in fact that language might accommodate some of the kinds of issues that have been brought forward by my colleagues on, on this school board. So yes, I would be interested in seeing some language. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you. And I would just uh, say that I, going into the schools now, I see how the schools are um, um, posting require. You know, uh, we're at, they're asking to have face covering, uh, but it's not being mandated. It's just a request. And I think our schools, uh, our school leaders, set the precedent to how that school is going to operate. And I agree. You know, having keeping a mask on, you know, uh, uh, as part of their uh, daily, you know, supplies, it's no different than me right now going uh, into different businesses and all that. Not all businesses require masks, but the ones that do, I'll put the mask on. Uh, you know, so I think uh, looking forward, I, I think what we got in place right now is is sufficient to us being able to operate without having to be, you know, having teachers be the policemen, uh, like Ms. Ivanchek said, having to be, the, you have one teacher that's implementing it and then another one that's not, but just giving, um, giving the schools that ability to uh, create that culture in their school. And I think like any of us, you know, if we go into a school and you see the principal wearing a mask and their staff wearing a mask, I'm, I mean, I'll put the mask on. That's not an issue to me. but. Also, you're going to have 
uh, places where they can't social distance and you know having a mask on then that's not a problem there too but you know again it's a uh, it is a double-edged sword that we're on right now and I would too like to just see you know um, I know you've already been talking to Mr. McInnes about uh, some of uh, policies that other schools are doing maybe not policies but just some of the direction that they're going so I think it would be fair just to kind of see what's going, you know, what other districts might be doing. But I am not, I will sit here and say I'm not in favor of doing a mandate. Uh, I think what we're doing now is is sufficient. I think uh, just but what I see, the leadership within the schools um, is strongly encouraging that. And I see people following that suit. So, uh, and I think parents and teachers, or parents and students alike would, when they go into a school and they see that, I think they will follow suit. So. And, and, and I thank you all. Um, and, and as we know, you know, school starts on August 31st. Uh, we have we have a board meeting on Monday. And you know, as I'm listening to all the all the conversation right now, if we were going to draft some form of a policy, um, <clears throat> I'm not not sure it would be appropriate to put it on this Monday's agenda. Uh, we'd want to make sure. I think we'd want to make sure that we uh, give our our parents the community enough time uh, to think about this matter um, we'd have the ability to have a meeting uh, next week if, if, if that's what uh, well, you so choose well mr. chambers uh, I know uh, mr. McInnes and I have kind of talked about this and because it is such a um, an important issue um, I think that you're right we need to probably uh, call an emergency meeting and I would suggest that we call it for Wednesday okay. that way that's plenty of time to get public notice and that way uh, people can come or call in uh, but that would be my recommendation that we have an emergency meeting which uh, Mr. McInnes said that we can do uh, Mr. McInnes yes sir the, both your policy and statute allow for emergency meetings particularly when the issue deals with the uh, public health safety or welfare and this clearly is part of, of that category uh, the chairman can call an emergency meeting uh, and we would give uh, the best notice we can there is not a mandatory notice time frame for the emergency meeting you have to do the best you can with, right. within the emergency right. how, how soon can we see some draft language I believe uh, I, I think I think it's possible to get some draft language probably by tomorrow yes sir. Okay, so it would be my recommendation uh, with this discussion that we have going on right now that we call an emergency meeting. That way we can give ample time for the public to be able to come and address their concerns and, uh, for when, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Um, do I have any comments about that? Well, I support your recommendation. Okay, thank you. And what we would do is... Um, um, Watching across the state the way that other boards have dealt with this issue, uh, I would propose that we would bring to you a proposed emergency policy um, that would deal with face coverings in this pandemic. As you know, those policies on the emergency basis are valid for a 90-day period, and that would give uh, some time to determine how that is working when the schools are open. We would need to start regular policy-making procedures uh, before the end of that 90-day period if that's what the board chose to do uh, so clearly adopting it as an emergency policy would be an interim measure as, as some of you have spoken about uh, and then it could be evaluated and superintendent could bring recommendations back to you if it needed to be extended or revised or whatever that could be done during that time frame before it would expire okay and I would strongly support that it would not be fair or ethical to leave mr. chambers on the field by himself no. And, um, and I totally agree with you. I think yeah. uh, that's why we're here on the board to represent the community and the schools as a whole and to put Mr. Chambers out there to make this decision. I personally don't think it's fair to him, and that's why there's five of us. Yep. And we're the representatives to the community out there. So, okay, do we need to make a vote on this? You can't vote on the workshop, but as a oh, that's right. chairman, that's the right. chairman can call the emergency meeting. Yes. As I take it, that's what you Okay. Done. Yes, so, so we're going to call it for this Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Okay. Mr. Chambers, um, so you indicated to Dr. White that you can have something drafted up by tomorrow, hopefully? Yes, ma'am. Um, what are you going to use what you've done in the, you said you've done some polling with the employees 
and the public and you and you're continuing to get that data so I did I did not say the uh, the public oh okay I'm um, sorry but uh, I've had numerous uh, conversations with with different parents whether it be through email whether it be through phone call or whether it be even out just in the community um, but definitely have had a lot of conversation as it pertains to masks and I think as all you probably uh, feel the same thing and you have there's a certain percentage on one side right. a certain percentage on another you know a lot of time it's almost a 50 50 uh, it's almost a 50 50 split um, and I think we have to make the decision whether we believe that this is a public um, health issue and, and can we accommodate what we need to accommodate with strongly encouraging versus a versus a requirement and so just so I have direction I think in terms of a policy I think um, what we're saying is we would look at some form of a I think we're saying that we would look at some form of a requirement of masks taking into account um, some of the concerns that, that, that you all brought forth today right. Okay. Thank you. That's why I was going. What you were going to base your determination on? So. No. Okay, uh, Dr. White, and then I have a question for okay. Mr. Chambers too. So. And and it's my understanding that other school districts in Florida have made such a requirement, uh, and so I would expect that you'll be looking to those other policies and other local school districts, and maybe even looking at the requirements on our military installations. As, as to the language that you might choose to incorporate in the policy that thankfully you'll be getting to us tomorrow. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. And Mr. Chambers, one final question. You were talking about 50-50 numbers and all that. At this point, how many, uh, what is the percentage of students that are actually, uh, actually going to be going back into brick and mortar? What is the percentage right now? And, and Mr. Mr. Hort may have to help me a little bit. I think the last numbers we were around seven thousand students, but that could have gone up a okay, little bit. So the percentage would be it's it's between twenty five and thirty percent at this point in that in that range. Uh, that are not coming to that, school that, that are going to begin the year at my school online. Okay. Yes, sir. Seven thousand right. two hundred and change, and it's growing each day with new registrations and and giving parents the option. That that is one of the the logistical pieces here, and so obviously right. with a. With, with uh, um, some mass discussions that could sway people right. um, and as you've heard well, one way or the other well, and which makes which, which which is a challenge right we, we'll, we'll work <clears throat> to do everything we need to do well and obviously 30 percent are keeping their kids at home for a reason 70 percent are not they're wanting them back in brick and mortar and I think it's important to gauge that 70 percent because those are the kids that are coming back to school so I know it's it's a tough task to do but uh, those parents that are part of the 70 percent we need to hear we need to hear from you what your thoughts are that's why we're going to call this emergency meeting so we can hear your thoughts okay thank you all right any other things re regarding COVID Mr. Chambers no sir I just uh, I appreciate this discussion and I do want to say I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, and this will be very quick uh, this 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 entire group that's out here today in terms of the just once again the, the the work that's being done to get ready for the start of school and the work of our principals and assistant principals especially on the master schedules um, this this is a this is a monumental task when, when you're talking about the online versus in the school building and as families come <coughs> in the online number might rise which then might change uh, a teacher's uh, what they're teaching or it might call for another teacher to be added to the online so it is a um, it is a monumental task but they are doing a fantastic job a lot of hours just once again and there's so much more than just the master schedule but this is just one example of uh, the hard work that that's going on right now all right yes sir Re regarding the special meeting yes um, I, I have one other request if, okay. if possible and yes, it's sir. not something that has no. to be done and superintendent uh, please use your own discretion um, but following up on Mr. Destin's remark about incidences or cases of COVID-19 in the school district uh, at this very moment, uh, Dr. Chapman has uh, provided us uh, evidence or information regarding those cases. And I know that uh, your team and Mrs. Schroeder is uh, uh, paying close attention to all of that. And so I'm wondering if uh, an update might be uh, relevant to this discussion 
regarding whether or not uh, we should uh, ask students to be required to wear masks in schools. Uh, I think, quite frankly, members of the public might be surprised uh, yeah. to know the information that we all receive, even though it's public information. It's not something that I think is often widely disseminated, but uh, it might be information that uh, the public might, might wish to know. No, absolutely, and if, and if it's okay with you, what we can do is get Ms. Schroeder. Um, we can make sure that she's here on, on Monday, right. and, and she can give a very uh, specific, uh, specific update on that. Okay. Is that sufficient, Mr. And uh, employees, by the way. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring out, both the employees and the student cases. Right. Yeah, and I would strongly support that because, as, as I alluded, we know we already have an issue before we've ever started. Mm -hmm. So that should uh, factor into the decision pretty strongly. Uh, Dr. White is exactly right. Absolutely. Right. We, we can do that. Is that good, Dr. White? Okay. All right. So let's move on down to the consent agenda. And we're at 8.1. And again, school board members, just stop me at any time if you have a, want to ask a question or a comment about any item on the consent agenda. So 8.1 will be the approval of the consent agenda. 8.2 will be approval of the minutes of the workshop meeting of August 6, 2020. Minutes of regular meeting of August 10th of 2020. 8.3, budget amendment number 10, fiscal year 2019 through 2020. 8.4 monthly financial statement for 20 or for June 2020. 8.5 invoices to be approved for payment. 8.6 school donations. 8.7 payroll warrant register and accounts payable warrant register for July 2020 totaling nine million sixty-eight thousand five hundred ninety-seven dollars and fifty-three cents. 8.8 .8, emergency purchase of accelerated student workbooks 8.9 request for price increase of ITB 18-07 custodial equipment and repair services district-wide 8.10 renewal of ITB 20-03 petroleum products and antifreeze 8.11 exempted purchase over 25,000 n2y LLC 8.12 exempted purchase over $25,000 Beacon Educator. 8.13 service agreement number 21-44 Gabriella Laco Mitchell. 8.14 service agreement number 21-45 Denise Dachari. 8.15 amendment to services agreement with uh, field print. 8.16 Okaloosa County School District bus routes for 2020 through 2021 school year. 8.17 School to Work contracts between the School Board of Okaloosa County and School to Work providers to provide career experience opportunities to eligible students at Silver Sand School. 8.18 Agreement between the School Board of Okaloosa County and Comprehensive Head Start submitted by Heather Willis Doxey. 8.19 Triumph Golf Coast pre-application for increasing technology capacity in CTE labs. And this was the added item, uh, 8.20 request closure of Riverside's elementary school child, uh, school child care program. And since this is a school that affects in my area, I want to. I was hoping that we could maybe have somebody come up and talk about what the changes are. I believe this is uh, we're going to be going into a contract with the Boys and Girls Club, and how that affects how we operate childcare, because this is obviously the first one that we're doing this with. So, yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just on behalf of Ms. Curley, who has been instrumental in working with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, of the Emerald Coast to make sure that those students continue to have child care. Uh, she has uh, basically transitioned the child care services from the district over to the, the Boys and Girls Club under their auspices. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a good situation for her because she'll be able to uh, have a good, worthy, and uh, 
pre-established program on her campus to facilitate the continuity of the program and also be able to focus more on the things that she wants to focus on with regard to her specific school needs and with regard to the the displaced employees we're working with them right now to make sure that they uh, fit into the right jobs that they have um, that we have plenty of opportunity for them to fulfill roles within the district and we're working with them right now to make sure that they have their their positions okay so, so uh, with this uh, being in place how does this affect because typically uh, daycares that we operate are revenue ge generating uh, um, entities so how will this affect obviously we're not going to be making is the is the school going to be making anything off of this they will there is I don't know the specifics of the uh, of the specific revenue but I know that it's not a it's not a, a zero impact in terms of that they're not just kind of giving away the child care services there's a right. deal between Boys and Girls Club and Riverside to continue to uh, generate revenue through that program for the school okay and uh, and I think there's three employees that will be affected by this and I, if I'm understanding uh, one two. is retiring yeah one's retiring and we're working on placing two okay. right now so um, <coughs> Anytime that we have uh, an entity like a Boys and Girls Club that comes in to run, you know, something that we've been doing for, uh, you know, Riverside for many years, uh, I, I think the, the one concern that I have is the oversight, you know, and especially it being on, on school property. And the Boys and Girl Cl Girls Club is a respectable, you know, entity, but what kind of oversight will we have over uh, um, that particular program well the the oversight with regard to the program itself is handled through the facilities agreements and the uh, and the and the whatever the, the transition agreement is that they sign between themselves the employees and the students are actually under the uh, under the auspices of the Boys and Girls Club okay. so they're the ones with the oversight there and then they as an entity uh, have to answer to the school district with regard to the facilities and ensuring that all of our policies are complied with and things like that so um, in the in the day-to-day -day operations it's basically a rental agreement with the okay. Boys and Girls Club well and that was going to be the the, th the why I was asking that because let's face it the principal is the face of that school and even though they're not overseeing that operation miss curley will probably be the first one that will get a call regarding any issues over there and like miss Ivanchek said you know earlier about being the the bad guy you know when you're enforcing a policy or anything like that this would be on miss curley so i was just i'm hoping that there is some you know some division there but also where miss curley does have some at least some oversight to a point there's absolutely um that understanding with miss curley um and as i said prior to that the the leadership of the boys and girls club specifically mr rasa who has been integral in this communication with miss curley has given her every assurance that they will handle what they need to handle but miss curley uh, very much relies on them right. as she does understand that she's the face of it and like i said from the district perspective we're we're fortunate that this is not the first school that the boys and girls club has gone into this is uh this is more or less a plug and play situation for them because they have lots of different clubs within our school district already so there's a high degree of comfort there with miss curley okay how so, many students are uh, being impacted? Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. It's like, and as Miss Lightborn, um, I think, I think as Miss Lightborn comes up, okay. I do think it's. I think it's. Uh, and you all may know this um, already, but uh, so the Boys and Girls Club right now operates at Destin Elementary as well as Kenwood, and then those are two off uh, the top of my head. And uh, was uh, Shalimar part of that too? Was Shalimar? No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right now the way it was operating they could handle 80 students with the boys and girls club they'll be able to handle 200 so they'll actually be able to have a larger population um, and serve more students in this situation um, and also uh, it will help the title one population as well as far as um, them being able to um, use the early coalition to have a discount for daycare as well so yeah. It's, it's a positive on the student right. side, absolutely. And, and, and since you said that, I was going to ask, uh, because Crestview is uh, dependent on a, a lot of daycare, and we do have uh, three schools up there that offer the daycare, but the other schools that don't, will they be able to participate in this uh, at Riverside, since there is a more of a capacity if they can get their kids to? I mean, I would, I, I would think, um, of course, Riverside would have 
for the Riverside students would right. have first opportunity. Right. And if 200, if they don't max out at 200, right. I would assume if they could get their students there, but I think that would be a challenge right. um, for before and after school because then they'd have to also get them to school right. after they drop them off to True. daycare before school. So True. I think that might be a challenge, but I'm sure if they, you know, if there was room that, that right. they would work through that. But this might be something in the future we can partner with the Boys and Girls Club at other schools, not just necessarily in Crestview, but throughout the district. That yeah, and be. like we said, we do have them at Destin Elementary and at Kenwood, okay. and they've been doing a good job. Um, also, Ms. Curley wanted me to mention that the Boys and Girls Club is also um, planning on some enhancements to their campus security. Um, at no expense to the school so they're putting keypads and door door locks in as well so they're doing some extra things as well so I think it's a win-win for everyone okay and and so Ms. Lightborn um, uh, and I'm Mr. Bryant you may know this as well I, is is this the recommendation of the school principal mm -hmm. yes she yes Ms. Mm -hmm. we have her letter yeah. mm -hmm. I, I figured it was just for the record and we all know they're a fine organization I'm sure they have their own internal background check system but as a contractor on our schools they would also have to comply with ours is that correct uh, I believe yeah, so, so yeah, yes. I can speak to that the, the, yeah, agreement, the agreement that's in place uh, for this program requires the level two background screening of all the employees it clearly sets out that they are supervising and responsible for the uh, employees they put there uh, they have to maintain insurance coverages while they're on the property, so all those matters are covered in their uh, facility agreement. Right, good deal. And, uh, and and I've talked with Miss Curley, and she's wholeheartedly behind this. I just had some questions I just wanted clarified, uh, just to be answered, so the public would know how we were going to go about this. So, okay. Any other questions? Or okay, so we'll move down to Superintendent's Human Resource recommendations, and we're. 9.1 employees on administrative leave 9.2 deferred retirement option program the drop 9.3 cleared certification requirements and issuance of contracts for the 2020 through 2021 school year 9.4 out of field report for the 2020 2021 school year 9.5 department restructure 9.6 employ, employment separations 9.7 personnel recommendations 9.8 employee transfers 9.9 instructional evaluation system 2020 through 2021 Nine, chairman just yes. just one question and dr hale i think probably could tell us this is there any big changes here mm -hmm. in relation to what we've done in the past are we speaking of the evaluation system? Right. Uh, primarily, the only things that have been done to the evaluation system through TEC this year is to change the uh, online um, progress monitoring software to update that. That language has been updated in there. Um, and there's also the addition of the My School Online option in there. But basically, yeah. the language remains essentially the same. Thank you. Yes, sir. But I have a question on that. I'm looking at this. At, I'm showing where the and student assessment. measurement is switched from is gone to I ready correct that's the progress monitoring piece that I was that I was okay. speaking of and then also I noticed there was something where it changed from and I don't know if it was just uh, language when it said something between formative and formal you know what I'm talking about on that yes yes the, the formative piece there's a for me is before and the informal so are you is, is this saying it's not the formal evaluation or Okay, Can so you clarify that? So I may have to defer to Ms. Peek. I may have to have her contact you back with some specifics with regard to that. Okay. But I know there's been some practical change with regard to informal versus formal observations over the years. And so um, I think that this language is to, is to just update the current practice uh, that the TEC came up with. But I'll, I'll have Ms. Peek reach out specifically sure. to you to answer that question because I don't have a better answer. It than may that just right be now. just semantics, you know, uh, language Correct. there. I'll yes, give it her. But you. I know in practice it it's basically the same okay great thank yes, you yes ma'am thank you all right so 9.10 uh, reinstatement reimbursement of sick leave due to line of duty illness injury medical examination and 9.11 leave without pay and, and mr. chairman I, I have a question regarding um, HR and uh, I can ask it now or yes if you would prefer I can ask it uh, under my business no, uh, let's go ahead and do it now Dr. Hill, I was curious if you might share with us and uh, members of the public 
how we are faring with the placement of our instructors, uh, teachers, and faculty, and staff uh, that may be uh, at risk uh, as, as defined by uh, the governor's executive order for COVID-19. Uh, and maybe you could give us an update on those employees and their placement and maybe how that's working out. And if you're not prepared, you can do it. Another I, I can speak generally, and I know that Mr. Horton may be able to help me with some specifics if it's, uh, if it's necessary, but I can tell you that the process as we transitioned into my school online, the first thing that we did was we asked employees to notify us of any high-risk condition through the HR uh, office because we didn't necessarily want to violate HIPAA with regard to school types of uh, information and transition like that. So we, we were given a, a roster of teachers um, who uh, had documented high risk in, uh, concerns uh, and so when we were doing my my school online placements the first group that we ensured had online opportunities through telework was those high risk employees um, and I believe that we have a hundred percent of them placed in a, in a telework environment um, as a as of last week and there may be one or two that we're still working on but um, there was a significant number of teachers who requested telework and, and incited high-risk status and so we worked with them first and there was a lot of negotiation between principals on who would cover this class and who would cover that class we actually got everybody in the same room together to to make sure that we were able to take care of of those employees first um, so as the numbers with the students continued to change, uh, we had to have ongoing, and we continue to have ongoing concerns, of, not concerns, but conversations about, okay, now that we've got everyone who requested telework inside at a high risk concern, once we've got them handled, how do we reach into the brick and mortar to accommodate some of these students that are requesting telework? So the fact of the matter is, is that all of our instructors who need uh, that protection uh, through teleworking were afforded that and we actually had to reach into the brick and mortar to accommodate some more of the student requests and some of those instructors were willing to do uh, either a hybrid or to transition to online to accommodate those things so um, I feel very confident that we have all of our instructors taken care of uh, with regard to their uh, requested health needs now I will say uh, that there are others who opted to work in the brick and mortar and accept the risk and and we ensured that, that we would do whatever we could through um, appropriate social distancing any type of accommodation that we can make to protect them for their uh, high risk status that we would do that and we've counseled our principals on that but the fact of the matter is that many of them wanted to get back in the school and see their kids but so I want to clarify that then for my my own needs so you you're saying then we do have high-risk individuals based on their health conditions that are still working uh, in our brick-and-mortar schools that's correct and we asked them to provide the documentation requesting that specifically because like, as I said the initial round was please identify any high risk factors or anything that may qualify you for telework and they did that and then as we started making uh, online assignments we started getting emails and say hey I don't really think I want to do that I'm, I'm gonna miss my kids uh, you know I want to be in the classroom with those kids and so uh, once we had that in writing and we, we afforded them that opportunity and, and as I said said we'll do whatever we can to make sure that this is uh, a palatable situation for you and that's where the um, the various conversations with regard to the, the masks and the barriers and the different things that you've heard that we're doing at actual school facilities to, to assist with some of these things that's when that comes into play and, and people make those choices even members that are present here today that's that may correct. be part of the special risk population right but they make those choices and and so we can live with that and we've the, and that's the instructor side and we've we've got some unique situations that we're working with with regard to our support personnel as well um, some of them are able to do telework some of their jobs just can so we're looking for alternate ways for them to be able to um, still impact the district if they can if they absolutely cannot then we're working with them on what that looks like uh, in their absence uh, but we have both of the unions uh, and I have gotten into conversations about so what do we do uh, within job descriptions if it just doesn't fit and we're trying to take care of employees and they've all agreed that we can kind of manipulate job descriptions within the same salary area to, to a take care of our schools but also take care of our employees to the best degree we can uh, simple fact of the matter is, is there are some things that just can't be accommodated through telework and we're having to have some tough conversations with them but that's been few and far between and the superintendent has uh, said we're going to try to figure out whatever we can to protect people uh, if we have to you know if it gets down to it then we'll have to have to make 
make a tough decision, but right now we're working with employees the best we can to afford accommodations uh, any way we can, and but still keep not only the district running efficiently and the schools running efficiently, but also to make sure that anything that's going undone at the school isn't a, an undue burden on some other employee that's there. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right. I have something, please. please. Okay, so oh, Ms. Sorry. Ivancheck, you'll go first, and then Dr. Okay. Kelly. All right. Um, on the hybrid model, particularly, I'm thinking on the secondary. Is, I don't know if you have to give me an exact number, but there's quite a few I'm hearing teachers who teach all day and then have the online. Is that correct? I, I think there's quite a few. And they get they folks, get the yes. sixth class, mm -hmm. and then, of course that helps with you know not having to hire. So. Um, when they have this class online, that adds quite a bit to their workload, doesn't it? So I might have to ask Ms. Lightborn to come up and talk. Ms. Lightborn was uh, working with the unions and the work groups sure. on the, the My School Online option, the brick and mortar option, and then of course the hybrid option to kind of make sure that all those things are uh, palatable and commiserate and right. equitable among teachers, And but I don't have the specifics okay. and she may be able to speak Okay, to thank, you. thank you. Hello. Hey. Um, so we have two kinds of hybrid models right. okay so there's one where in order to make a teacher whole because of the numbers that have gone out of the brick and mortar mm -hmm. a teacher might have three periods brick and mortar and two periods online so that is currently occurring their model and their time is a little bit different than a full-time online teacher the full-time online teacher ha can have more students um, and have more responsibility as far as contact time goes um, because they're available. Um, that was done through the work group um, that, that I think I had presented you guys the full online. Mm -hmm. So we have that going on. We do have some teachers um, in order to cover all of the online that we needed. And so they might have three classes brick and mortar and three classes. Um, online so in that situation they do have a six subject and they are paid um, extra for that six subject so that is occurring but um, w when they're blended it they are to contact the parent and let the parent know I'm a blended teacher so we'll be following the brick and mortar schedule of every other day contact mm -hmm. um, b just like we are doing brick and mortar because if that teacher is teaching so if if it were you and you have one three five brick and mortar mm -hmm. and then two four um, which is on Tuesdays mm -hmm. and Thursdays um, online then one three five we can't expect that teacher to go beyond their six, seven and a half hours right. on that day so they would be doing their time on those okay. every other days gotcha. does that make sense yeah it does thank you I appreciate that mm -hmm. okay Dr. Kelly. so my question was pretty simple <laughs> no it was for Lee probably okay. but but more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have a contribution. So my question was just with regard to somewhat uh, related to COVID with the Destin High School students, have we been able to accommodate all of those students since they their school wasn't able to open? I know uh, we had said prior to yeah. that that they would be counted in the FTE just in the event that that school didn't happen on time. And I was just wondering if we had in registration, yeah, and, if we and had and accommodated I'll pause it for students. a second, because I, I, and we'd have to double check that. But I think the bottom line would be those students have already either enrolled Into in our schools or on the online program. And that was my presumption was yes, I know prior to all of that unveiling of the school when that was being talked about, we had said that those numbers would be calculated into their regular projected school. So. Just want to be sure that all students are taken care of. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Dr. Kelly? No, okay. that's it. Mr. Destin. I, I just want to thank Sheila and, and all the folks that have been working on this. As we all know who follow the news, one of our adjoining counties laid off 80 teachers and reassigned 80 more without <laughs> where going where they didn't want to go. <laughs> we have not come to that, and we have them to thank for that so far. And, and this is really still uh, an ongoing an ongoing process. Uh, the decisions we make on the mass, the decisions we've made on the barriers are going to determine between now and the 31st how many choose not to come back. And so uh, their task is still not done and, and won't be done for a bit yet. So I wanted to thank them for the fact that 
we've not laid anybody off so far. Right. And we've not had a lot of reassignments that people didn't want. And that alone is a lot to be proud of. That's right. And Mr. Destin, also, I think our instructional staff, our teaching staff, for being so flexible and being so open and fluid with whatever we ask them to do. So I think we owe our teachers uh, a big thanks. And I've heard you thank the Absolutely. unions as well. But this is a new world for them, mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Well, and I agree with Mr. Destin there. In light of what you see across the country, we are very blessed that we have been able to work with our our unions, our teachers, everybody. And everybody has come together understanding that this is unprecedented and mm -hmm. you know we're going to work together we're going to get through this but I, I would definitely say that you know Okaloosa County has stepped up to the plate once again and shown what it what it's like when you work together instead of working against each other and we're able to accomplish amazing things and you know moving forward I think we're going to prove the state that we can we can do this all right so we're down to section 10, discussion agenda, 10.1, uh, items moved from the consent agenda. At this time, there is none. So we are at 11, construction program owners representatives business and 11.1 .1 program status report. Mr. Destin. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we are still working on all of the agenda items that we presented at the last meeting. They're all moving forward at a proper pace. Uh, we have a couple of things on this morning that are associated with those and and then mr horton will talk to us about an even more complicated issue <laughs> <laughs> the uh the half cent sales tax list so okay. that's all i have to report this morning well thank you mr destin and so we do have a couple items we'll be voting on monday night so 11.2 authorization for professional services agreement from faithful and gould for price value Price validation for program number six, task order number eight, Kenwood Elementary School kitchen dining roof replacement scope modification, owner direct directed change order, and that's presented by Dr. Bill Smith, and he is in the audience if we have any questions. And then 11.3, the district proposed half cent sales tax capital project plan, and Mr. Horton, if you would like to make your way up, I'm sure, or Mr. Chambers. And I'm just going to say just a couple of things and as Mr. Horton comes up. Um, I think, as you know, uh, you know we've, we've, worked with, uh, we've worked with our schools. We've worked with Jacobs Titan in terms of getting a, uh, a list of, of capital project needs at each school. And I know Mr. Horton, <coughs> Dr. Smith, um, they've also done a great job uh, of working through this, this process. So I think the list that, that you're going to see, you're going to see that every school um, if we were fortunate enough to get this half cent sales tax, would uh, be receiving um, some upgrades, some improvements, and I'm not talking necessarily just luxury updates. It's you know some of it is just things that that have to be done when you're talking about 61 percent of your buildings um, being 40, excuse me, 50 years of age or older, and 75 percent of them being 45 years of age or older. So you'll see some needs there. This list also takes into account um, growth across this school district. I think the last five years, we've had about a 1.5% uh, growth in students, which is almost 400 to 500 students. And I mentioned that because we, I think, I think one of the things that uh, part of this discussion today and maybe even Monday is, you know, we have to look at how big is too big in a school. Destin Elementary, you know, how, how big is, is too big? Should we have elementary schools getting towards 1,200 as, as growth in increases. Davidson Middle School, you know, do we want Davidson Middle School to be about 1,500, 1,600, you know, as, as time goes on? And we know Ruckel is, is a big school, Blue Water. You look at capacity, and one of the things that I've learned that I did not know is um, a lot of times when you get to approximately 80% capacity within a school, in other places, they start looking to build a new school. And and Mr. Uh, Horton will, uh, will correct me if I'm wrong, um, the vast majority of our schools are well over 80% capacity and some of them are over 100% over capacity. So I say all that to say, you know, part of this discussion today is the needs, that the, the critical needs that, that we have at schools and then it's we have to look at where we would potentially uh, build new schools in Okaloosa County. And the building new schools um, as we have it set forth, would not come from the half cent sales tax money. 
and then Rita would be prepared to talk a little bit about that as well. Also, some of the needs that uh, you'll see on there, especially when it, it's the high school, I think those of you who've been at the high school, you know all the different activities that happen after school and the, the challenge for space, um, whether it's athletics, whether it's uh, the cheer, the dance, which they're absolutely athletes, whether it's band, uh, there's so much of a, a clamoring for space, which it, which it gets very difficult. So you'll see that's something that was taken into account as well. And I just appreciate uh, the work uh, that Mr. Horton has done, Dr. Smith has done, working with Jacobs Titan as well. And uh, so I just wanted to give that just th that brief uh, intro. And Mr. Horton, if, if you'd come on up. While he's coming up, the information we got for each school, I think you said this, let me make sure. The schools gave this input, right? And Mr. Each school Mr. gave the input for the list, correct? Absolutely. Every school yeah. was a part of the yeah. process, and Mr. Horton will probably talk about that okay. a little bit as well. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, board members. And so a lot of information to talk about today and, and certainly a lot of questions to, to answer and, and, and have asked, so I'm happy to do that. Um, one of the things I just want to front load with you on is that um, uh, Jacobs Titan and the representatives who worked on this, this project with us will be here Monday night for additional questioning um, and be able to speak to it. and, and um, um, and we'll make sure that we're available for each of you individually to have time to sit and look over these um, pieces. So um, if you recall back in January, um, or actually in March, we came to the board and presented, a, it was about three and a half hour uh, presentation and, and uh, on um, the capital uh, projects and, and the process that we're going through to identify those needs for a potential half cent sales tax. And so. Um, at that time back in January, Ms. Ivanchek, you're exactly right, we, we met with each school with the team from Jacobs Titan. Uh, we brought our own facilities folks to and, and looked at the needs within the school from a principal perspective, from the school advisory council chair perspective who were also invited to those meetings and accumulated a master list of projects. Um, and some of them um, more critical than others, but nonetheless a master list. And I think at that time in March, I reported to you that project list was in the neighborhood of 480 to 500 million dollars in cost. And I think we all knew going into this process, um, if we were fortunate enough to receive uh, sales surtax funds for 10 years, that um, they would likely not be enough to solve all the ills uh, in the district that have accumulated over the past. 20 years. And so that's kind of an acknowledgement going into this process. Um, when, we, um, when we looked at, um, and we came to you in March and looked at what um, other districts have done over the last 15 years to, to address their capital needs, um, we saw and reported that most districts, uh, very few, uh, almost every district has alternate sources of, of revenue coming into the district uh, in support of or in addition to what we refer to as the two mill money, which is what all districts receive based on local property taxes. So um, as, as, as a district, um, we realize um, that, that other districts have found funding sources and, and many of them, them voter approved, obviously, um, and, and felt like it was a critical point in our, our history um, with the growth that we experienced and, and with the condition and aging of our buildings that, that, that we look you know, potentially to the voters for that source. So what, what's created for you today um, is a, um, a coffee cup, um, one sheet of project lists at each school that had, had significant input from the principal um, and then was blended in with obviously facility needs. So, so where the principal may or may not um, believe uh, or think um, off the top of their head that an HVAC chiller or boiler replacement was critical. Um, when you start to talk about the different calls that they've had to place for air conditioning not working, I know that Fort Beach High Schools has made it through potentially six phases of a, of a 10 phase uh, HVAC completion that's been put on hold for the last several years. And so the, 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 the facilities department and Dr. Smith um, and, and maintenance have, have blended in with these principal inputs and SAC chair inputs um, to come up with project lists that we believe is a, um, a responsible um, and forward thinking use of potential um, tax payer approved revenue sources. So with that said, these projects were produced. Now I want to make sure everyone's aware and understands that, that there's a lot behind these projects. So the first question that might be asked if I'm sitting at the coffee, uh, sitting with my cup of coffee is, well, 
what are the costs of all these and how do we determine what those costs are and and that's what um, our, our total project manager um, Jacobs Titan um, has expert experience over multiple years including the last sales tax um, program in Okaloosa County at developing these costs so so rest assured um, that those are available those are there and, and they're not on this particular document today because I wanted to make sure that um, um, uh, in talking with with those groups that that everyone could see the projects for what they are um, and then be able to get into the details of the cost as time moved on um, certainly it's the case when you look at a Meg's middle school that's one of our older middle schools and it's a ramp school when you look at the needs of that school um, compared to say the needs of a Riverside elementary that is was built this century they're going to be different um, their enrollments you know Riverside has more kids but it's a it's a much newer facility and it was built um, with 21st century in mind and so you know <clears throat> when you start to look at dollar amounts per school and, and per student it becomes complicated because it's clear that in some schools more is needed just to get just to get that school up to a level of, of, of where it's more functioning. Um, and so that's a component as well. The, the, um, the other thing that I would say, Mr. Chambers alluded to this, is that um, we said back in March um, in that presentation, um, to, to, to quote Mr. Chambers, how, how big is too big on some places? So right now, for example, Destin Elementary, recall as a K-4, as a K-4, not a K-5, is, is our largest elementary school in the district. So that, that's an issue. Um, and the fifth grade already being at Destin Middle. So in that area, those two schools are, are, are at and beyond capacity. That's, that's occurring in other places as well as evidenced by portables in our building. And so the question that we posed back in March and have been asking all along is, um, there is a tipping point at which time, when you look at four or five different campuses, maybe whose footprint is not designed to get any bigger, and you start to look at adding wings to them and expanding cafeteria and expanding media centers and other things in a school and you start to look at the aggregate cost of doing that across three or four schools and then you look at the cost of potential new construction where you can really be forward thinking and say this is a better solution for the next 10 to 15 years and when that cost um, starts to align because it is expensive to do wing additions and to do cafeteria expansions and those sorts of things. When those two costs align, I think that's when it's prudent to look at new construction. Uh, and as you know, we have not had any new construction um, in terms of complete campuses, I think, since um, 2000, 2007. 2007. Um, and so we watch to the west and the east of us as new schools are built, um, and, and they look palatial and, 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 and you know, all districts are growing. Um, so I think that that's what the superintendent's directed me to do is make sure we're investigating that, that piece. So what you won't see on these project lists right now, let me, let me say one other thing if I could. Um, so the COVID piece is more than just about masks. So COVID has, has caused us to think about lots of things long term. So we say that 25 to 30% to of our students are going to my school online this fall, which is gonna make our school buildings a lot less crowded to begin the year. What we don't know is once COVID ends, what does that mean for that 25 to 30 percent? Does, do, do, do 5 percent of our 30 percent decide that online is the way that they like to do their education? And so those who maybe have not ever dipped their toe in the water now are going to say, well, I'll just continue with an Okaloosa online model because I don't foresee my school online. That was kind of a, an emergency model that, uh, that many districts implemented, but it's probably not something feasible going forward. We would probably use a, an Okaloosa online model that's more traditional. But what does that look like? And what does that do to our enrollment, our enrollment growth? Is it a one-year hiccup? Is it something that, that, that carries forward? So that is a, a, a complicating fatter, factor in discussions about expanding. Um, whether it be wings or, or school buildings. Um, but, but nonetheless, the project list that you see here, um, I believe is not impacted by that, that factor. And so um, Mr. Chambers mentioned that, that um, the sales surtax money, um, which, which is expected to bring in about 230 million, um, would provide funding 
for all the things that you see on that project list. And again, Jacobs Titan will be here Monday night to speak to that in more, in more detail. Um, the things above and beyond that that the district needs um, requires an addition, a, a, separate, a separate plan. And it might be a parallel plan. And so we've said that, that, that what we're trying to do is, 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 is correct and remediate the things that we've been needing to do for the last 20 years. And, and it's, not, it's not me, it's not you, it's not the superintendent. When you look at it and you see, um, and I, we presented this in March, the, the funding streams that other districts have that are making use of, and we just have not had the availability to have uh, the past um, 20 years. And Dr. White has mentioned before, there was a, a sales tax effort um, a decade or so ago that did not succeed. Uh, had it, we may not be in the exact place that we're in today. Um, so the, the, the project list that you have that I'll be happy to answer questions um, regarding, I think addresses some important things. It addresses security and safety. Um, it addresses in, in places where um, it's appropriate, it addresses growth. And so it may be there are areas of the county where it's not appropriate to, to, to look at a new school, but it may be appropriate to put a small <laughs> classroom addition um, if a cafeteria is being um, expanded or turned or, or, or a cafetorium is being is, uh, built, then you can make use of that existing cafeteria space um, and go ahead and add classroom space there. So there was some of that in those plans, um, but um, in general, safety and security, um, renovating these uh, old facilities. You will see a page on here for school buses. Uh, I think that, that is part of the referendum and part of the half cent surtax question. We do have the oldest bus fleet in the state. Um, we, we just got some feedback, I think, that, that, that says it might be appropriate to, to refresh our buses at a 12 to 15 a year rate. I think the proposal here contemplates 10 um, a year, which, which over time would get us in a very good shape with our, uh, with our bus fleet. Um, as you know, very, very few of our buses are air conditioned. We have some of our ESE buses, our special needs student buses are air conditioned, but but the other ones, by and large, are not. Um, and, and, you know, in, in northwest Florida, um, it's more than just August and, and May where you have to worry about hot buses. Um, and, and so that is a big issue, um, and, and let alone the condition of the buses as well. So, so that's part of the plan. Um, the, the, the other thing that I would say about this, and then, I, then I'll open up to questions, um, certainly, is um, just to be clear that this list these items were established um, at the school level by school principals and the groups that they brought in to, to discuss those um, and district folks. And so I want to make sure we're very clear about that. Um, and then the other thing is it is obvious, it is clear that schools are not able to have everything on their list. And so it, it's, it's also clear that, that um, you know, Sometimes there's disagreements over, over, over what should go on the list and what should not be on the list. And, and that's part of life uh, as it relates to this. Or who got what. <laughs> or who got what. Right. Um, which is the other piece. And so going back to the Megs and the Riverside example, and that, I don't know the, the numbers off the top of my head, but it, it, be, it would be very, um, it, it could be the case that there start to be phone calls going back and forth about, you know, this school got X number of dollars, this school got X, X minus a million um, or, or whatever, and, and why is that? And so I think it's, 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 it's a fair question. Um, I think the answers speak to the, the conditions of the school, the needs of each school. Um, and, and so um, it, it can never, I don't think, please everybody. But I think that, that um, this project list is a good beginning to a fall. Yes, sir. But Mr. Horton, I, I think in, in one way you already spoke to that. I think, I think if I heard you correctly, the initial list approached $500 million. Yes, sir. And, and the reality is, is that even if we should be so, uh, I'll use the word blessed, uh, by the public uh, with this funding, um, it's only about half of, of, of the original list. So uh, obviously you, you, you and your group and all the folks involved in this had to do some kind of prioritizing uh, of, of those needs that clearly are there. but. But uh, as a former superintendent long ago, and for many people, they won't even know what I'm talking about, he used to say, 
it's not all you can eat at Howard Johnson's anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough funding there to do all that. Right. So. Well, and I like the fact that you did say in a different way, but I'll try to be more succinct, that some buildings just don't need as much as others. So what we're doing in essence is trying to bring them all up to a certain standard. Some might need this much, some might need that much. Yes, ma'am, and, and, and to your point, the principals um, of, of those schools understand that. And mm -hmm. so I, I could stand, stand before you and say that, that in those schools that are newer, that maybe have fewer needs, those principals have been magnanimous and, and to a person have said, um, we know we can do with less. And so it really falls back to them because they are the ones who, who, who kind They're of take collegial. up that mantle. And the second um, thing, I just, I appreciate that there are no costs on there because I understand that by the time we get to the point of actually building, all those costs will have fluctuated and changed and it might not be prudent today. It might be a different cost factor a year from now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're exactly right. And one of the things that we, that, that you know, in, in coming up with that original $500 million price tag on all of these components, um, you're right. That that's our cost estimate now, and, and Jacobs Titan has been doing this for a long time. So, so okay, I have I have a level of confidence in what they're telling us because this project list is one that they believe um, that we can get accomplished um, through a surtax. And sometimes, and in, 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 in I would, wouldn't ask Rita to speak to this, but sometimes in a normal environment, um, the sales tax revenue that comes in over 10 years often exceeds what the projection is. And I say often. We're in a COVID environment now, so it's it's difficult to even think about what the sales surtax might be next school year, what the what the tax revenue. So so hopefully you know we can get through this because it would have an impact on 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 this on on this particular project. Yes, um, I didn't see anything on here, um, but I wanted you to address the thing about we want to move towards getting our portables out, right? Yes, ma'am. So. Um, I know some of these as we add facility will do that and so uh, was that a, a goal when you were looking through this to get away from portable usage as so much yes ma'am that, that was something that we talked about and that was that goes hand in hand with new construction um, and and um, so so when when you don't see wings put on buildings here with the purpose of removing portables the, the idea would be uh, as we move and look at construction that th that would be the way to remove portables. And I think we also said back then with the number of portables we have, it's not something where we'd be able to kind of do this and remove all portables and build. And in some places, to be honest, we have some schools whose enrollment is flat, whose enrollment, um, you know, certainly COVID being an, an, an awkward year, but we're seeing um, fewer kindergartners this year coming in. And I'm expecting that there might be a bunch of parents out there who are saying, maybe we'll just sit it out a year and, and we'll start next year and see what it looks like and so in some buildings in some locations in some locations you're seeing um, not as many classrooms in portables and so I want to be clear about the whole portable situation is I wouldn't I wouldn't and I wouldn't expect the superintendent would recommend we build a wing to remove portables if these two portals are being used by um, you know our, our itinerants as office space or or something along those lines because I think you know we're trying to, to work to have students removed from portables in classrooms um, but 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 to your point construction uh, um, um, construction would alleviate those portable issues in in many places and, and to follow up mr. Horton I, I think that's valuable analysis because the last time that we successfully did this and removing portables was a goal we there was no burden of constitutional language regarding <laughs> class size and so that made it a little bit easier to accommodate the removal of all of those portables the second piece of that is that uh, in fact uh, uh, there there was an example of a school that we did uh, successfully build a new wing to and removed 13 portables but because of enrollment as you're suggesting that school has now been closed and no longer even exists on that plot of land so I appreciate you looking forward thinking at enrollment and, and what can happen at these schools and and so I think you're right uh, uh, 
uh, we have to be judicious in, in how we look at that. Yes, sir. Um, and then just kind of speaking a moment more about about uh, potential construction pieces. Um, I, I thought, and superintendent um, kind of instilled in, in me in this, and I've heard board members uh, speak to this in public meetings, that I think I think I have sent surtax. It is very important for all schools to benefit from it, all schools to receive significant projects, um, and so. I, I would not. I would not propose to you that that half cent surtax money to be directly used to construct um, two schools here or a school there. Um, I think that that you know we've been saying for a long time, and it's true, and and we want to make sure our current schools, um, and and not anticipating closing any of them, but our current schools are are brought to a level where they are. Um, we, there are things that we can be proud of. Um, so, as Mr. Chambers said, the, 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 the thought of additional schools, I think we as a school district, wow, I hope we as a school district, <laughs> if, if, if the people listening probably didn't God, God's hear telling, that. God, God's telling you something right we, there, Steve. So, <laughs> we as a school, we as a school district um, continue, continue through our two mil money um, to do things that we need to do, and, and board members are aware that um, we're finishing in the next couple, next year or two, um, paying off debt for the last um, some some last construction that was done, and so I believe that 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 the district is if the surtax if the surtax is passed by the voters, the district is possibly in a good position to be able to do some very forward thinking as it relates to constructing um, some new schools, and I think that that. That, you know, and I've, I've had a chance in the year and a half to, uh, with, within the facilities department to look at the, the capital outlay um, budget, and you'll see that as an item um, further down the agenda. But um, I'm confident that, that if, the, if, the board, um, if the board is of a mind and if the, 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 the citizens approve the surtax, that we'll be able to do so much in the school district, it will reduce our, it will reduce our ongoing maintenance. Um, and some of the things that we have to budget for each year, um, but it will also give us the flexibility to, to do some things with our own two mil money to be partners in this project. And at the end of the day, it's all taxpayer money. And so it all has to be spent judiciously and in the best way possible to the betterment of the kids and the, and the teachers and the families. Um, but I think that we're, we're poised here if this, um, if the surtax is able to be passed to, to really chart a course for Oklahoma schools for the next decade or two. Mr. Destin. Thank you, Chairman. As the board representative to the construction maintenance people, I've been in on a number of these meetings. And I, I want to tell you that uh, Jacob Titan has a very well thought out, robust plan, recommendations, you know, complied with, with uh, Mr. Horton and his group for new construction. And as Mr. Horton said, those two were parallel. In my opinion, they're more than parallel, they're joined at the hip. Without the surtax, the new construction can't happen because we estimate to go forward with the entire program is about 500 million. Uh, the sale tax will generate 250. We can do the other half. But if the, if the sales tax doesn't pass, then we will have to use our half to keep the schools from falling down around our ears. Um, and, and I spoke to superintendent last night and and we're going to have them come and give us a presentation this is not this half cent is not just what we see on the half cent ballot it is the key to everything we need to do to bring the, the district forward for the next 10 years um, you know we do have some needs some very big needs as, as we spoke about the Destin elementary you know uh, there are seven to nine hundred residential units permitted and under construction in Destin. Those are apartments and townhouses who young people with families will most likely move into if half of those family have one child. You're talking about 300 more kids for Destin Elementary. Uh, they have a very good plan about uh, putting, and they have the property there, of uh, putting a uh, pre-K through two section on some of that property that's available and uh, taking the pressure off of that and may even take pressure off of Destin Middle School by being able to bring maybe a grade back. We have the same situations in the North End. Uh, you know, some of those schools 
we're going to have to either we have to do new construction. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Uh, in the middle section too, you know, we've got some needs for new construction. Without the half cent, mm -hmm. that can't go forward. And so I know that our, our partners at the chamber and Ms. Anchor's group need to go forward with a plan so that they can start campaigning. But we need to make it clear to everybody that this plan enables new construction. The last time this passed, they had a component of new construction in it. This does too. While they may not be tied to the directly to the half cent, the half cent makes it possible. They can't happen without it. And that's a very important um, argument and understanding we need the public to get. Uh, while a lot of the stuff on our list is keep the building from falling down on us, it, if, if we don't get that money, then the, uh, the, the nicer, brighter things can't happen. And so uh, I, I look forward to having uh, Jacob Titans tell us about some of those really nice ideas and so that the people understand it's a package deal. You're not just voting to fix roofs and HVAC and and uh, get rid of some portables, possibly, okay. but you're voting to carry the district forward for the next 10 years. Okay. And uh, without that component, I fear about our ability to pass it. But it is a very real and a big part of what we're doing. Right. And I would just say that uh, piggybacking off of what Mr. Destin said, uh, this is an investment for the future. And looking at it from a private side, which I came from before I was on the school board, you know, it's easy for a business to raise the price of goods to be able to accommodate their expansion or, you know, build new buildings and all that. But we don't have that luxury. You know, uh, we could, but none of us up here are going to raise the taxes or anything. We're, we're going to operate within our means. Uh, with that being said, there is some concerns uh, or just looking at some of the schools that we have now you know as far as would it be feasible to close those particular schools down and rebuild a brand new school instead of putting money into a school that's like Meg's for instance that's set 60 plus years old and uh, you know we do have room next to it where the stadium is something like you know and just build a new school or next to Shalimar I believe we have property there but to be able to build a brand new school instead of uh, you know putting money into something like dr white said you put money into something and we end up closing it down are we being very good stewards of taxpayer dollars and from what i hear you're y'all are looking at things like you know is it going to be better just to build a brand new school instead of sinking money into uh you know a school that's crumbling away you know yes sir that's a very good question i'm sure you got you you guys and ladies get asked that question um so usually in a situation like that, I mean, Meg's has just undergone its single point of entry piece, and so there's some significant work that was done in the name of school safety there. Um, when you talk about that, I think it would it would have to be a very, very dire situation uh, because the cost of building a new school on, on the location mm -hmm. where you might be doing some renovation of another one, those are kind of orders of magnitude different. Um, and so we say there's significant funds going to Meg's. It is, it is, and I'll let Jacob Titan speak to that, but it's nowhere near the scope of what a of a of a tear down and new construction would be. And so when you look at an area like like Shalimar, and it could it could be anywhere, um, you know, we're actually seeing Meg's enrollment um, uptick a little bit. I, I say it's the Tracy Lamb effect there, Miss Lamb, the principal. But um, looking at the feeder paths, Elliott Point and in Shalimar, their enrollment's holding right now. And so. Um, you know, in some ways, some of Fort Walton Beach is kind of getting a younger demographic and, as they're moving in, and you're looking out by the, by the mall where they've got a um, large number of apartment complex um, coming online. So um, I think, generally speaking, um, where, where unless it's dire and the building is, is in a shape where it needed to be condemned or something, we probably, probably, um, and again, we're looking at, at growth projections over right. time. So unless we see a downward like this in enrollment, I think we would, probably just just um, work and renovate the building we have well, and, be and, my there, thought. and there are other older schools and right and I sure. hate to call names but Wright elementary for example or even prior middle school um, those those schools are close to the same age as mm -hmm. as, as Meg's middle school so uh, I, I think your money would go pretty quick if you looked at replacing schools 
and all the other needs and all the other kinds of things that Mr. Destin was talking about, uh, you just wouldn't be able to do those. Yes, sir. So, yeah, I understand. I, I did have one more comment, Mr. Bryant, if yes. I might, if, if, we're, if you're ready to move on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to make sure that, that everyone heard and, and understands that there are financials that accompany this list, that there are real numbers attached to all of these projects that are listed under every school. And, and that those, those will be available. Uh, is, is that I understand that correctly? That is correct. And that, that's what Jacobs Titan um, is excellent in. I'm a math teacher, but, but they know the construction business. Um, so those, those are, um, are there, the underlying financials. Yes, Very sir. good, because one of the criticisms I've heard is that we, we haven't produced uh, financials, that, that all we've produced is a, a want list. And that's just not accurate that there are real numbers, real financials associated line item with each one of these projects that will be available for those individuals that would like to look at that. And, and everyone should be confident that, that these aren't magic numbers, these are real numbers attached to these projects. Yes, sir, absolutely. Right. Yep. And I agree with Dr. White there showing those numbers because I just sat here and said it's an investment. And if I'm a, stake, a, a stockholder in a particular entity, I'm a, I want to see the numbers and how that's going to affect us in the long run. And, uh, and I think that will help, you know, ease some, some concerns about just our wish list. Yeah, we can throw that out there. But if we have the real numbers and, you know, of course, Rita w would be able to talk about how all that money is divvied up in our $430 million budget, you know. So, you know, that could help us get that message across that you know you're 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 taking a vested interest this is where your money's going to go and we're going to do our best to be good stewards of that so yes sir um, so i agree well, with dr white it's it, it's imperative that we put that out there you recall that three and a half hour presentation back in march do you remember it went like that for me but but a lot of what you're referring to in terms of the the budget coming from the state and the two month money we we kind of went through slides on that and I'll make sure that that, um, it's certainly under board docs, but make sure we put that up on our facilities page right. and everybody can see that presentation as well. Right, right. And, the, and the numbers associated with, with these. these projects mm -hmm. at these schools so that the, the I believe, unfounded criticism is, is that it'll be evident that there are real numbers attached to these projects in yes, these years. Even though we already know that some of those numbers are going to total more for some places than others. That's the and, way it works. And, and Dr. Smith has been great. Um, he's been joined at the hip uh, with Jacobs Titan uh, this week, and so he's my point person for making sure that we get that information and in, in, in put it in a presentable way so that pe people can see those numbers. Excellent. Very right. good. I have one more thing, please. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Um, and I think that's very good uh, that Dr. White brought that out because that's very important. But one other thing I'm asked as a board member by citizens and I know we could spend a lot of time on this, but maybe just briefly, is how did we get here? What have we been doing with the money that we, you know, to have this problem? Um, now, part of it is I want to say, look, this is where we are, and it's, we can show you where we are. And I don't know that a long history lesson of how we got there makes a difference because I feel like, you know, you got to go with where you are. But just briefly, uh, and I'm not as well spoken on on the financial piece as, as certainly you are, Mr. Horton and, and Ms. Scallon, but um, I, don't, I do believe it's worth saying briefly that revenues over the past years coming from the state have been cut. So we've not had the money. Is that correct? I'm gonna let you kind of pick it up from there of what to say, what you would say to the public about, you know, we're not going on cruises with any extra money. The bottom line is we've lost revenue to do some of the things and we've had to put a Band-Aid on things that truly needed surgery. So and I'll speak in general good. terms and then if Ms. Gallen uh, wants to follow up on it. So you state. might be referring to, you might be referring to the two mil um, capital outlay money that comes in, which is our primary source for funding uh, capital projects and our maintenance. Um, and that had been cut twice at the state level by a quarter mil, and so it's now really 1.5 mil, which is a uh, dollar fifty for every thousand dollars of your property taxes that you and I pay. Um, but I, I don't even use that as an as an excuse per se, 
So that has, that has decreased the amount of funding that we would have otherwise received under a true two mil, but other, all the other districts took a haircut um, in the same way. And so if it was equal across the state, then, then I, we wouldn't have any more reason to, to kind of feel the pain. Uh, what I said earlier in this was that if you look across the state, um, the other districts have not been able to figure it out and, and survive the way we have for the past 15 or 20 years. They've all reached out to their voters and have, and have been successful to, to help, uh, help with additional funding sources. So yeah, the two mil money is really 1.5 mil now, but that happened to everybody. I think in our district we, had, we have significant um, portions of our capital uh, budget that comes in every year. We've been using um, six plus million, um, as much as nine million I think at one time, of that money to, to pay for the schools that we built before. Well that's money that is not used for maintenance and other ongoing roofing needs. Um, we, we capitalize and we, all of our technology in our school district, there's a cost to that. And so that comes out of our capital budget before um, we get to repair mm -hmm. the first roof. Um, maintenance transfers is a capital uh, expenditure that's eligible that districts across the state do use with us. And so there are, um, there are, there are simply more needs than funds available. And I get it because, I mean, I work on a, I work on a budget. And so when you see dollars and, and, and budgets out there in the millions, mm -hmm. it's easy to get caught up in um, and it's understandable to say that's a lot of money you ought to be able to do that and then when you look at the cost of, of fixing something repairing a roof and it's a, a 1.4 million to do one roof part of a roof at one building um, that's when it starts to you start to see the the um, the other side of it but um, I don't know if I answered your question or just yes and, an, and another point too is um, and I know dr. white and some of some of us have grown up here there was a, a time frame of maybe 10 or more years where a lot of schools were built and those now have come of age so to speak so when you have a lot of buildings that are all old then it, it takes a lot more uh, on a, a, a yearly basis to keep them sustained and usable so it's kind of like if your refrigerator washer dryer car everything kind of goes out at the same time it takes a lot of money at one time to get into that and so we've had to put a little bit here to keep each thing going and and now it's time that we're to a point like you said of of, of crossing that to where it has to all be the big picture looked at so that's another thing to people look back at the history of this school district there was a time when there was a lot of building going on in between and mr dr white can probably help me round about mid 60s yeah. right, into right, the right. 70s at least a 10 to 15 year time frame and they're now aging right and the older things get the more repairs and the more Certainly. things that have to be done with them and we used to receive a special uh, federal impact aid for construction and that's what it was used for and of course that that stopped long long ago um, I, I guess the thing is is that uh, I think that you've all done the best you can in, in trying to, to put these resources together and, and then beyond that, there, there's a, another cost that we have now that we didn't have back in those days. And hey, it's significant, and it's a reality of where we are, and that's technology. It's a huge cost that, that we, we have really have no choice, that, mm -hmm. that we've moved into that world, that back in those days when they built those old buildings, they, they really didn't have to worry about or, or think about that the way, the way that we do now. Yes, sir. So. And, then, and then to piggyback on that, the, the, the security piece. Yeah. Our, vision, exactly. our view of security now is completely different than it was 10 years ago. Right. And so I, I do want to mention something about these project lists. And so you'll see single point of entry on several of those. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, you won't see it on others. And it, it's because the, the, the board took the action two years ago to begin those single point of entry projects and not wait on anything and so we have kind of cannibalized some of the capital budget to make sure we do those things as a priority um, those have been done in schools where you don't see it on the project list the second thing um, a question was asked of me well what happens if something on this project list gets done this fall or or is, is has been done or let's say a roof collapses it's actually on this list and it's got to be done in an emergency manner could these project lists ever change well in that kind of scenario it could and we would absolutely notify folks if that were to happen 
Um, one of the things is the single point of entry projects. You know, we're going to ask the board to contemplate continuing to move in that direction this fall and not wait on the sales surtax. There are some schools out there where it says single point of entry project there, but, but if we can get the board's approval and move ahead with some of those, and Mr. Destin's lead, led that in the construction meeting, um, we will pull some things off of this project list, which is only a good thing because then it, 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 it would allow us maybe to go to the next item um, on the list for a particular school or something in that, in that, if that makes sense. And that's a very good point, Ms. Horton. Uh, 50% to two-thirds of the security upgrades that our study groups and that the sheriff's department and that we all believe need to be done are still not funded without this half cent. Uh, that would have to come out of our own money and would, of course, have a severe impact on the other things that need to be done with that money. So uh, I, I don't know how we can stress anymore how important it is that this pass from all of these different acts angles so you know it, it's good that people understand what's at stake and I, and I just wanted to add one thing to Mr. Vancheck's question earlier which I think was a good question and Mr. Horton if, if you would kind of also address the amount of dollars that that we spend in Okaloosa County FTE wise and on capital uh, projects maybe versus some other counties based on their additional uh, revenue sources so you put you put me on the spot here so I'm not gonna <laughs> be able to say it exactly but it, what I think it was part of that March presentation um, what what happens is a, a good metric to look at is dollars um, capital dollars expended per unweighted FTE which is essentially per essentially per student and so um, when you have a county that has fewer students but more capital dollars and you look at that that dividend there of of maybe fifteen eighteen two hundred two thousand dollars per student spent in capital expenditures per unweighted FTE then you look at Okaloosa and it's a tenth of that it's 300 that was the one um, I, you know I attended one of the uh, one of the meetings that Miss Anchors and their group had uh, out in the community and that was the thing that they were were most shocked by is the expenditure level that we could as Okaloosa County make per student on capital compared to other districts and and I think what we um, shared with you is is um, um, it's, it's pretty telling it's pretty telling it's why you're seeing new schools going up east and west of us and, and, and nothing at this point in Okaloosa well there are 67 counties in the state of Florida us in Citrus County are the only counties that do not have any other funding piece besides what comes in on property taxes and I, I agree we have done our best to be good stewards of taxpayer money like I've said with what we've had and and again it goes it's a credit to everybody within the school district that Okaloosa County continues to be one of the top school districts in the state with what we have but what could we be with that investment in the future if we had the schools that were up to date with technology and safety and having all those uh, components in place for our, our students to be successful and our teachers to be able to uh, pass that on to our students. So uh, I just say that to the public out there that, you know, if, like Ms. Vancheck said, we're not going on any cruises or anything like that, but what we have, we have done everything we can to provide a quality education and all we're asking uh, the public is to consider this investment and like Dr. White said we're going to show you the the real numbers so you can see what your investment's going to get you over 10 years so bottom line our students deserve this yes. and our employees our buildings need to reflect our philosophy of being the best thank you Mr. Right. Horton. that's a good way to end it all right Thank you, Mr. Horton. And one thing about workshops, we have great discussions, and this was a great discussion. So Excellent. thank you, uh, Mr. Chambers, for uh, providing this information for us. So now we'll move on down to Section 12, Information Technology Seat Management Contract. 12.1 uh, Task Order Number 2-161, Online Learning Preparation. 12.2 task order number 2-162 Okaloosa County School District outdoor WAP installation 
12.3 task order number 2-167 Northwest Florida ballot uh, AI phone project and 12.4 task order number 2-168 Bob Sykes portable project and 12.5 change order 16 to the IT seat management outsourcing agreement contract modification agreement Chromebook Chromebook seat and support pricing okay and now we're to Mr. McGinnis's business just one item Mr. Chairman I need to request that you schedule a special board meeting to conduct an attorney client session in regard to a matter of pending litigation uh, the case is pending in Oklahoma Circuit Court it's case number 2016 CA 001472F and we would request that you schedule that meeting at 8 o'clock uh, a.m. on September the 10th which is your next workshop day so okay. we would have that meeting prior to the workshop school board members are we good with that mm -hmm. okay so be and that's okay. all I have today okay thank you and mr. chambers all right um, we it seems like everything we talk about right now is, is COVID related and that, that, that does uh, dominate a lot of what we're doing right now. But I do wanna, I do wanna share with the board that you know, as we get closer to the start of school, you'll, you will start seeing more and more information coming directly from schools, and you're already starting to see that already. Um, I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to see Antioch Elementary's um, video where all schools are doing this, but Antioch Elementary, for example, they're, they're showing parents through video what happens from the moment a student gets to school all the way to the moment they get back on the bus at the end of the day so this particular video which will be similar uh, across the district you know it shows kids getting off the bus the precautions that are there they're coming in you know what if a student's coming to the front office during the school day the cafeteria the, the hallways so the schools have worked um, really really hard and the principals have done a great job with staff to to communicate with families so they have an understanding of what to expect uh, but I will say just a little bit of a funny uh, you know we, we sent out the Antioch um, elementary video and I think it raised the gauntlet for uh, <laughs> the level of expertise of of these videos so the schools have done a great job with that um, Miss Lightborn Mr. Horton Miss Scallon uh, Dr. Hale um, have really also worked with each of the schools in their particular areas to make sure that we are uh, ready for the start of this school year um, pre-planning will be here well it's here yeah, <laughs> it's it's here and you'll start um, seeing even more uh, from trainings to informational meetings um, from brick and mortar all the way to my school online so just uh, so much and I say this all the time but so much has happened if you remember it was early July when when the state said we were going to create these um, these new uh, options for for families to be able to get funding for the year so a lot has occurred in just a little over a month and um, I just couldn't be more grateful so I'm thankful okay all right so anything else mr. chambers that is it sir okay so now we'll move to board members announcements and requests for information and I will start with Ms. Ivanchek today yes thank you um, well a lot of good things I, I know that uh, some of the teachers went back on their flex days this week and what I'm hearing is all very good and I know that coming through next week I'm uh, hearing they're grateful to have this time I think it's important for everybody to have that that kind of time to get back into something that's just too many things that we just haven't had to do before so I appreciate the district working um, that out one thing I'd like to ask and it's probably uh, Dr. Hale is I know we're using a lot of protocols to keep our classrooms clean and everything. Are we in good shape with having personnel like cleaners and so forth? Um, we have enough of those in place at all the schools. Now you're talking about like a response team, is that what you're? Not the response team, but just day to day. I and mean, we were doing additional cleaning and we have custodials, still some custodians, but we mainly have cleaners, right? Right. Well, we have uh, custodial and cleaners. and cleaners at every school. We do have some jobs that remain to be filled. Uh, many of them have to do with the response team and the additional things that right. we put in place. Um, of course, if you'll know, it's not a, it's not a typical of any other year. We're always searching for yeah. cleaners and custodians and things like that. Um, but beyond that, we've also um, 
had discussions with the unions that, you know, beyond just the, the routine cleaning and the things that occur in a custodial manner each and every day, um, that there's going to be a lot of um, teamwork with regard to even our, our other uh, ed support staff, our teachers, everybody's going to kind of uh, hold hands and share the load for some of this uh, new stuff, the sanitizing, the taking care of things in between uh, classes and, and whatnot like that. And we've had uh, both unions again uh, as we've been working through some of these things that we just kind of agreed to is we agree that it looks different and we're just all going to have to step out of our comfort zone a little bit. And so uh, whereas we do have uh, some jobs that remain out there to be filled as every year, um, I feel confident that we have everything in place to take care of those needs and so that will be part of the training next week correct for yes. the teachers to learn those protocols and what we're doing yes. right which is great so that's yes. why I'm so glad we have that time thank you thank you Appreciate it. that's all I have thank okay. you dr. Kelly well I would just say if you saw my post I visited three of our schools and I will say I took my temperature and signed in mm -hmm. and had my badge on and rang in and they were following protocol. The teachers who were there working were delighted to be there because they're in their element. They're doing what they love to do. So it was delightful to see them happy and to be back where they belong. And I know their principals too. I saw all three principals. They were doing their thing and happily welcoming their faculties back. And I'll just end with congratulations, Mr. Chambers, and you can count on me to be a team player. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you and Mr. Dustin. I don't think I have anything further today, Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dustin. Dr. White? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to uh, follow up on Dr. Kelly's uh, remarks, um, we normally don't talk about politics up here on this dais, but um, the truth is that's how at least six of us up here got here. <laughs> And uh, it may be the way some of us leave. <laughs> but uh, what, what I would like to say to you, Superintendent, is congratulations on a, on a massive victory that uh, I believe is uh, an endorsement and certainly a mandate uh, for your leadership and for your administration. And uh, I'll just conclude by saying let's move forward now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, in closing, I would just like to uh, – also congratulate Mr. Chambers. Uh, I look forward to working with him for the next four years. Uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, I saw Mr. Sansom had put out a nice post yesterday about working together. So I'm encouraged that, you know, we're going to have a, a unified team moving forward, especially with the half cent sales tax moving forward. So I'm really encouraged by that. And, uh, you know, the other thing I would just like to say to the public out there is that, you know, like all of us up here, we, we truly care about what's going on out there and you know like dr kelly myself i've visited several schools over the last week and our teachers our principals our support everybody is excited to get back to normal some type of normal uh, and it's encouraging to go into the schools like dr kelly said they're following the proper procedures you know i get temperature checked everywhere i go i have my mask if they you know if i can't social distance so but to see the the reaction on the teachers and the principals you know they're ready and excited to get going on uh, august 31st so that's encouraging and i and i would just encourage parents to reach out to your schools and i'm, I'm encouraged by the videos that are going to come out i got a glimpse of the antioch video so these are tools that we'll have in place to help educate our parents as we move forward uh, and as dr white said earlier we are we are mandated to have schools open up but with that being said we're going to do everything we can to make sure that when we open up schools on august 31st there we're going to have everything in place to make it a safe environment for your students for our teachers for everybody that's involved and uh, so i'm excited to see get to august 31st yes, sir. and, and uh, mr bolton i see you're out in the audience if afterwards if you would please just see me before you run off okay so uh, we do have 16 which would be public comment this is the two-minute version of the uh, previous public comment at the beginning of the meeting and we do have some public hearing on Monday night so 17.1 will be public hearing for adoption of revised school board policy 04-28 emergency operations school safety and security 17.2 public hearing for adoption of re revised school board policy 04-33 violent crimes possession or use of tobacco products alcoholic beverages drugs weapons or firearms 
17.3 public hearing for adoption of revised school board policy 04-32 discipline and 17.4 public hearing for adoption of revised school board policy 04-49 school threat assessment teams and 17.5 public hearing for school districts five-year capital outlay outlay plan and I'll go around the room Mr. Horton anything you'd like to add Miss Lightborn Dr. Hale Miss Gallen okay this meeting's adjourned thank you